And I actually think that it's good that the annual meeting of the Dante Society can be online so that all members who are so inclined um, can join. And um, that's what we're doing today. In the past, the annual meeting, as many of you know, was always held in Cambridge, Massachusetts with very expensive hotels, um, according to the bylaws, and it took a great deal of undoing, uh, led by Nancy Vickers and Albert Ascoli to, um, to free us up from that. Um, and in the past, this business meeting, which will be brief, I promise you, for members happened the day after the spring council meeting and preceded a day of interventions from scholars on a theme. Um, in 2020, that symposium, uh, Dante Soma Luce, which was planned to be in St. Louis and hosted by Michael Sherbrook at uh, Washington University was forced online in September of that same year. The 2021 collaboration with Harvard University for the uh, centenary, which was meant to be a return to our society's origins in Cambridge, as well as a look at Dante across the Americas was held online in May of 2021. And those recordings are now available on our website. In 2022, thanks to the initiative of our vice president, Beth Cogshall, our Dante show went to Sarasota, Florida in March. The advantage of this venue was that for the first time we were under the auspices of uh, another conference, the New College Conference in Medieval and Renaissance Studies held uh, biannually in, in uh, Sarasota. And we held our spring council meeting then. So that was back in March. I have um, some updates on some, some things that are going on. I've been in conversation with Virginia Jewis, who is author of a brand new facing page, Vita Nuova translation. Um, and she is now associate director of the Alexander Grass Humanities Institute at Johns Hopkins about hosting the 2023 annual symposium in Baltimore. This is strongly supported also by the director of the Alexander Grass Humanities Institute, William Edgington, who is not a regular dentista, but is the author of a terrific essay called Dante Hyperspheres and the Curvature of the Medieval Cosmos and by our own fellow member and former vice president of the Dante Society of America, Ariel Saber, who is going to be joining Johns Hopkins in the fall. Uh, I also want to announce a recent addition to our society of a graduate student group. Uh, we were approached by um, uh, three graduate students, Mario Sassi at the University of Pennsylvania and Paolo Scartoni at Rutgers and Leonardo Chiarantini at the University of Michigan. Uh, they held an, an, an initial meeting, a membership meeting, let's say, this past February, had over 20 people in attendance. They're going to start an email group of their own, uh, organize some workshops and a reading group. Uh, the motivation of this group is to create a cohort of young scholars, all working on Dante, who are, of course, spread out among the different institutions and often have few or no peers as direct interlocutors where they are. The, the virtual world opened up by the pandemic made them see this opportunity for coming together. So the society has welcomed this new initiative. We see it as a way to get the next generation of scholars involved in our activities, also in our volunteer activities, uh, both to carry them on and to reinvigorate them with their fresh ideas and perspectives. And we believe that this new graduate group will benefit not only students who will have the opportunity to get to know each other and professors working in the field, but also professors who will have the opportunity to know and work with more graduate students than their home institutions can support. The society is currently investigating the possibility of internships and apprenticeships in the various areas of our activities and models of compensation and support that might include reimbursement for travel for students presenting at any one of the many conferences with sessions and panels sponsored by the Dante Society of America. I would like to mention that such an initiative would be made possible by a very generous donation made to the society at the close of 2021. In any case, the society is looking forward to including and supporting this association of young scholars. Uh, so um, if you are interested, or if you know of any graduate students who might be interested in this group, you can contact me or Christian or Mario Sassi, who is the current uh, uh, point person liaison who is at the University of Pennsylvania. The minutes of all of our recent annual meetings are on the dantesociety.org website under the heading of meetings and events, and then past DSA meetings and events. 
Um, I'd like to take the opportunity always to remind members of some of the benefits of membership in the Dante Society, which is still $40 for college and university professors, $30 for K to 12 school teachers, and $20 for students. In addition to supporting the journal, Dante Studies, the membership comes with some uh, JSTOR, I think, benefits. Anyway, you can get articles and so forth um, that might be very useful to people who do not have a, a, a college affiliation. Um, and to those, I might add the use of the Society's Facebook page, which is currently open only to members. We've thought about this a lot and think right now we can only open it uh, to members. Um, so if you're a member, you can participate in that. We are grateful to, the, to all of you for your support of the Society and would like to emphasize that uh, its mission is not to exclude, but to include. To quote our website, our mission uh, is to encourage the study and appreciation of the time, life, works, and cultural legacy of Dante Alighieri um, and I, uh, throughout the world, I would say. This is a society not just for academics, which makes it uh, rather particular, and in that sense it is a rare public-facing institution that integrates all manner of folks around love of a single author who merits, shall we say, all this attention. So our society has become quite transnational and we're uh, thinking of ways in order to include some of those uh, members who are not residing on the continent, uh, this continent, or even in, in the South America, but even uh, across the pond, uh, finding ways to include them more since they are actually me members. Uh, so thank you all. Um, and I want to thank particularly the card carrying members for being active and vocal and for offering your talents and services in this volunteer society, for staying faithful to our little society and for making financial contributions over and above our modest membership dues. So today we have um, a wonderful program and so we're going to try to make the business part of this meeting, which we have to conduct according to our bylaws, very brief. And that's going to be made possible because our secretary librarian Christian DuPont has, uh, is going to put everything on the website in case you want to see some of the documentation. But there are a few things we have to do, I believe starting with the approval of minutes, but perhaps I'll hand it over to Christian to lead us in that. Sure, I'll do that. Thank you, Allison, for the report. And uh, we are up to 53 participants now, so that's really great. Uh, and with that, I think we have exceeded our requirement for a quorum for this meeting. So we can officially uh, vote on our minutes and. <laughs> The other little things we need to vote on in accepting reports here. So, um, as Allison mentioned, uh, the uh, minutes are certainly going to be posted there. I did post in the last little while um, the uh, the agenda with these advanced reports in it, and I emailed that to all of you. So, if you have that handy and want to refer to it, um, I'm going to provide for my parts of the report just very brief summaries of each of this because I know we're all anxious to move on to the program here. So with the, uh, the minutes, if there are uh, those of you who had a chance to review or were present at the last meeting, if there are any corrections that you'd like to advise me of at this time, I thank you for those who notified me earlier by email. Um, I will uh, propose a, a motion to accept the minutes as uh, last distributed. In second. Okay. Those in favor, a simple acclamation will do. Thank you. Okay, so minutes from last time are approved. And with that, oh, I have a hand from Albert, though, Oscar. Is that, I think that's just a hand saying approval. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. Uh, former President Albert Oscar. So good. And I will at this point ask Michael Sherberg as our treasurer to um, give the treasurer's report. Spotlight you as soon as I find you on the Zoom here. You'd like to unmute there, Michael. I know you're there. There we go. Now, you know, hopefully everyone can hear me and my connection will last long enough that I can complete the report. Um, as of February 27, 2021, the value of the society's investment account with Vanguard stood at $330,416, representing a slight loss with respect to the value of $332,492 reported at the annual meeting of the society on May 7, 2021. Um, 
the decrease reflects retreating values of major stock indexes since the beginning of 2022, as I'm sure many of you are aware. Uh, the balance of the Society's Bank of America checking accounts stood at $60,482 as of February 27th, 2022. The balance included a recent gift of $25,000 from a total pledge of $50,000 from an anonymous donor uh, that has been completed as of uh, a few weeks ago. Um, the gifted funds uh, will be transferred to the Vanguard investment account and sequestered there until the council decides uh, on how best to deploy them. Uh, Allison spoke about this briefly during her report earlier. Um, the combined value of the Vanguard and Bank of America accounts as of February 27th was therefore $390,000. Uh, $390,534. Uh, our total revenues for 2021 were $20,987 against expenses of $25,108, resulting in a deficit of $4,121. As a, at the spring 2022 council meeting, I proposed a revised budget for 2022 that projected expenses totaling $25,550. And I believe that we will meet that target. That is my report. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I'm back to me here. Um, and let's see, I need to. Oh, let me go. Okay. So, the uh, following on the uh, Michael's report as treasurer, um, I'm going to present uh, just very briefly the report of the audit committee. Um, the audit committee is responsible for reviewing the records that the treasurer keeps, uh, including our bank statements, to make sure. Uh, that all monies are accounted for and that proper accounting practices are in place uh, and also to make any other recommendations. So briefly, the uh, audit committee met on February 28th to review the 2021 year-end reports um, that were prepared by Michael as treasurer. The audit committee consisted of Daphne Park as chair, Jason Alexander, Dennis Looney, and myself as members. Uh, we met uh, via Zoom. The committee found the accounts in good order and financial health of the society to be sound, as Michael just reported. Uh, we did make one recommendation for the treasurer to provide uh, councils with additional details about donations received by the society and the reports that are provided to the uh, uh, to the council, um, and, uh, and that's a simple recommendation there. So I would ask, with that, that um, again, this is a we we want to uh, we officially receive the treasurer's report and audit committee report. So I'll call for uh, I'll make a motion to do that and ask for a second and then a simple uh, acclamation as well. Here. So I have a second on that motion. Report, I'm seeing one out there, thank you. And again, a simple acclamation uh, for signing the uh, nays there. Okay, thank you. So we uh, have accepted now the treasurer's and audit committee report, and that really concludes our voting here for um, the meeting. I will now just give a, uh, a summary of, the, of my report as a secretary and librarian here on our membership statistics. So again, these are distributed to you and very briefly, we have a total now of, uh, at this point in our membership year of 446 across our various categories of regular life, um, secondary school teachers, students, honorary members, fellows, um, which is with respect to about the same time last year. I'm still waiting for the, the May report comes on Monday of the second Monday of the month. So uh, kind of, it, it can't make it quite exactly month to month by comparison as uh, we do from last year but uh, a slight decrease, about 25 members behind from, from last year. So um, I expect we'll catch up a little bit, but um, on the other hand, I think we also had a surfeit of members of uh, people joining during the, the great anniversary year who may not choose to renew this coming year. But I'm um, really encouraged that we've had um, you know, very steady numbers among our students, which have grown um, uh, a lot in the last couple of years, and our high school teachers. We uh, have more high school teachers now who are members of the site at any point in time of 23 this last year. So. We're delighted for that. Okay. Uh, I can also just report briefly on behalf of the um, um, the prize committee. I'll do this a lot of order because then I'll save the nominating committee for, uh, for a moment here. The, um, the the prize committee. This is for prizes that were actually announced um, at the end of 2021, so in December. So this has already been distributed to the society. If you're on our um, membership mailing list, this is kind of a reminder for you that we have the three prizes: the Dante Prize for Best Undergraduate Essay. Uh, was awarded to Benjamin Connor from Brown University. Uh, the Charles Hall Grandin Award for the Best Graduate Student Essay was presented to Catherine uh, Catalina Nicodemo of the University of Chicago. And the Robert M. Durling Prize for Excellence in the Teaching of Dante at the secondary level was awarded to two recipients this last 
here because their applications were uh, a bit different and had different strengths and the committee really uh, wanted to recognize both in this past year. So Homer Twig, the fourth of Damasa Catholic High School in Hyattsville, Maryland, uh, and also Jennifer Wan of Boston Trinity Academy uh, received the Durling Award for this last year. So uh, the uh, nominations are open now for the Durling Prize uh, through J July 1st. So you can nominate others um, and, and simply by going to our website, referring to the instructions there and uh, sending me an email at dantesociety at gmail.com. And those of you who um, teach students at the undergraduate or graduate level or uh, no students who are, are doing good work on Dante, please encourage them to submit their essays. The students should submit their essays uh, directly to the society. And again, instructions are on the website under prizes on our main headline. Now to our nominating committee, which will conclude the, the business portion of our meeting here. Um, those of you who are members of the society will know that uh, because uh, we have many guests here today, of course, for our program this afternoon, so we're delighted for that. But those of you who are members were uh, presented with, uh, with electronic ballots uh, for uh, the positions on council. Our council uh, generally consists of uh, six members, and uh, we had uh, on three-year staggered terms. So this last year, we are saying, uh, first of all, a, a warm thank you, and a not too just a farewell to Daniel Caligari and Warren Ginsburg, both of whom are on our call today. And we really thank you for your service uh, to the society throughout your careers here in the last three years as members of council. So thank you, Danielle and Warren. I see some applause and hand clapping in the background. So, um, and then uh, to fill those two vacancies on council, I'll read in alphabetical order the uh, four candidates that were proposed uh, by the nominating committee uh, with input from the membership. Um, and the committee always considers a balancing rank, gender, and contributions to the field of Dante studies uh, in proposing nominees for the slate. So the, uh, the four nominees for this year um, for election are Catherine Doyle, professorial lecturer, Department of Romance, Dramatic and Slavic Languages and Literatures at George Washington University, Fabian Alfie, professor of Italian at the University of Arizona, Carol Kyoto, uh, inaugural librarian for collections and digital scholarship at Harvard University, and Alessandro Vettori, Professor of Italian and Comparative Literature at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. Uh, I can say that we had a total of um, uh, 86 ballots were received from our total voting eligible membership um, of uh, what was that at the time was 392. So a voting participation rate of about 19.7, which is about what we normally see. So. Um, so without further ado, we, um, I am very pleased to congratulate on behalf of the society, uh, our newly elected counselors, uh, Captain Medoyo and Alessandro Vettori, both of whom I believe are present here on our call this afternoon. So let's uh, applaud them both and welcome them both to, uh, to council. All right. Thank you, thank you. And I'll just go back to, to Alison now for a moment, as, uh, as I, I'm sure you wish to uh, welcome our new counselors and say a few other mm -hmm. items of business before uh, introducing our program this afternoon. So thank you. I do. I want to um, echo the, the call for submissions for our various prizes. Uh, robust uh, submissions make for, uh, for uh, great winners. And I um, would like, if uh, I did see Catherine Adoyo and if Alessandra is here, um, uh, Victoria, if you'd like to say hi. Um, and Something? Hello, everyone. Thank you so right. much. I'm. Where are um, we? Can we highlight? Uh, sorry, can you hear me? Put the spotlight well, at, on her. Yes, where is it? Yeah. <laughs> ah, there we are. Oops, sorry. Thanks, Alison. Thanks, Alison, and and uh, and Christian, and to all the members of the Dante Society, and to all the voters. I'm I'm honored and excited about joining the Council of the Dante Studies. Um, as you read on my little blurb, I am I'm particularly inspired by, by Dante's um, pluralistic view of the world and his, his intolerance for injustice. So know that this, you will probably be hearing a great deal of this, uh, about this from me. And uh, I'm just seeing Beth is on the, on, on one of the, the, um, one of the cameos that I have in front of me, Beth, Laura, myself, and um, and another uh, theology student <clears throat> at Cambridge are putting together a uh, a group that is going to be focusing on developing the theme of 
Dante Poet of Justice over the next foreseeable future. We have uh, right now uh, plans for up to three years hence, but we're thinking to continue uh, pursuing this thematically. So if you hear from any of the four of us or eventual um, other members who come to join us, please um, think about it, uh, consider joining us, contributing, and also, um, and also uh, critiquing some of the approaches because I think the 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 best way we can contribute individually and as a group is to um, is to receive uh, um, um, uh, constructive criticism and uh, to persist in this internal radical self interrogation that Dante inspires us to do. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Catherine. I don't think Alessandra was able to make it, but. I hope he'll pop up if, if I'm misreading that. He was traveling today, so it might've been very difficult for him. So we welcome him in absentia. And so now I want to wish a warm farewell uh, in gratitude to our dear friends and colleagues who are currently cycling off. And they, I know, are here today. And that's Warren Ginsburg and Danielle Calagari who have helped us in innumerable ways. Um, so uh, thank you very much. So I would now like to turn to the main event of the day, uh, which is entitled, uh, thanks to Warren, Quel Savio Gentil, honoring our teachers, John Frichero and Robert Hollander. I want to thank most heartily the organizers of this event, which is Warren Ginsburg, Simone Marchesi, and Frank Ordway, as well as the six um, speakers. I, I, I was about to call them students, but in fact, that's why they were invited, because they were students, um, among so many, who agreed to formalize some reminiscences about their experience of these great scholars as teachers. Afterwards, we will welcome discussion and comments and additional reminiscences from anyone here. I believe the best way to do that would be to uh, raise your electronic hand, um, but you might wanna also use the chat. I'll, I'll be monitoring it. Among our guests today, I wanna to extend a special welcome to the children of John Frichero and, um, and Robert Hollander. Thank you for joining us. Um, so I think with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Warren, um, who is going to uh, introduce the first set of speakers. Yes, thank you, Allison. Yes, thank you all for joining us for this acknowledgement, commemoration and celebration of two of the greatest uh, teachers of Dante in the last century, last 50 years for sure. Uh, John Fichero, of course, uh, had a peripatetic career. He taught at for any number of years at at least five major universities. It was a very difficult decision to make to ask uh, people to represent some of those uh, universities, some of those experiences at different universities at different periods as well. And so I, uh, of course, would hope that people will join in to supplement the uh, talks that we're going to hear from the three that I did uh, finally reach out to and who graciously agreed to share their reminiscences with us today. The first, I'm going to introduce all of them and they can just follow one after the other and when they're done with their presentations. The first is David Quint, the Sterling Professor of English and Comparative Literature at Yale University. David first took John's Dante course as an undergraduate in 1969, the year that uh, Frichero came to Yale. Uh, then uh, he took the course again, twice more, as a graduate student in the early 70s. Eileen Reeves is professor of comparative literature and an associate member of the program in the history of, the, of science at Princeton University. She studied with John from 1982 to 1987 at Stanford. And Danielle Caligari is assistant professor in department of French and uh, Italian at Dartmouth College. She met John in Florence in 2007 and studied with him as a graduate student at NYU from 2007 to 2014. We also should mention, of course, that uh, Cornell is in that list of places that benefited from John's presence, as well as Hopkins. But from, uh, that's all I really want to say by way of introduction and turn now the proceedings over to David Quint from Yale, who will speak first. 
Thank you, Warren. Um, who's to spotlight your video later? Okay, I, I'm, I'm all set. Um, I've been asked to talk about the teaching of John Fichero, but I also want to say something about Robert Hollander, who was my colleague at Princeton for 15 years. I didn't take part in his celebrated Dante course, but we taught together for 15 years in a year long great books course that Bob designed and superbly designed at that. Bob loved to talk about literature. He treated me as an equal when I was still a raw junior professor and he and I discussed back and forth the books on that syllabus. My own books on Montaigne and Cervantes owe a large debt to that course and to those conversations. I add that Bob batted behind me on our terrible softball team, and he was almost always good for a sharp single or double to right field. So it's hard to talk about the teaching of a professor as charismatic as John Fichero, and I'm going to be talking about his teaching he was a lifelong friend as well. As was the case with many of my fellow students, his course on the Divine Comedy was life-changing for me. It made me want to become a teacher and student of literature. John made it both intellectually vital and sexy to read Dante. Dante came to Yale, as, as Warren has said, in the fall of 1969. The university was in a golden age, the English department in particular. I'm just going to mention William Winsett, Cleanth Brooks, Maynard Mack, Jeffrey Hartman, Harold Bloom, Thomas Green. Perhaps slightly defensively, John was not going to be impressed. He had, after all, come from the Johns Hopkins of Leo Spitzer, Don Cameron Allen, Earl Wasserman, Charles Singleton. That was a home of deep scholarship in romance philology and the history of ideas. He let me know that the new criticism which Yale was teaching me was unhistorical and held a whiff of right-wing conservatism. I duly reported this bombshell about the new critics to my superb English professor, Michael Lachlan, who slightly raised his eyebrow. This was the late 1960s, and in this spring, Yale would be on strike over the Bobby Seal trial. John organized a small group of Yale students to distribute in New Haven's Italo-American neighborhoods a leaflet that compared Bobby Seale to Sacco and Vanzetti. That bit of community organizing did not get very far, but we also didn't get beaten up. John was indebted himself to the pervasive new criticism and its insistence on close reading and the relationship of poetic form to meaning and to its delight in ambiguity. It helped to make his reading of the Commedia less doctrinaire. Nor did he offer a lot of political readings of the poem, I think partly because Dante's local politics can be unappetizing. But his own insistence on the long-term intellectual history that underlies the poetic imagery and the very metaphors of the Commedia came as a breath of fresh air into Yale's critical environment. He also quite consciously brought a grand tradition of Catholic scholarship and thought into Yale's WASP intellectual world. A little more of this below. John practiced a highly sophisticated form of Kvalen Forschung, unpacking not just a model or source for a Dantean passage or illusion, but the long history of thought that the model brought with it. And he would, and I think this was his greatest gift as an interpreter and teacher, spell out the human logic, the meaning for us readers in the present, of those sometimes arcane intellectual and theological traditions. John's readings of the Commedia were less interested, I think, in spelling out the poem's theological answers than to showing us the human problems and quandaries to which they were addressed. These resonant readings were further enriched by his demonstrations of analogies in other literary and filmic works. His invocation of how African-American spirituals reworked the same biblical tropes on which Dante depends. Who's that come and dressed in white must be the children of the Israelites. Who's that come and dressed in red must be the people whom Moses led. Who's that coming dressed in black must be the hypocrites turning back. John loved to recite that, those lyrics. They were the three colors of Satan's heads that show the process of his fall from grace. He invoked the Jordan imagery behind both the angelic boat of Purgatorio II and little Eliza crossing the ice flows in Uncle Tom's cabin. The different Jordan imagery that turns the end 
of La Dolce Vita, where Marcello cannot hear or reach the adolescent Paola into a version of Dante's inability to reach across Lethe to Matelda in Purgatorio 28. In the fall of 1971, Paul de Man came to Yale. John joined the discussion around deconstruction, although his texts of choice were St. Augustine's De Trinitate and the sign theory of Charles Sanders Pierce. He wanted to know what deconstruction could offer to the reading of Dante. Nonetheless, it was through John's teaching that most of the Yale's graduate students around me were able to understand what Derrida and Demand were up to. He above all, and I also want to mention Robert Durling and Eugenio Donato, brought not only Dante, but also Italian studies into dialogue with literary theory out of, out of Italian's provincial corner and into a larger conversation across literature and philosophy. John was already equipped to do so because of his engagement with a philosophically informed Catholic tradition, largely French, concerned with the Bible and the Church Fathers. And I'm thinking of Pierre Courcel, Jean Daniel Lou, and Henri de Lubac, all three of whom turned theology into a kind of poetry. And also with Georges Poulet, Kenneth Burke, and very importantly for John because of their close friendship, René Girard. These were not names to be conjured with at Yale until John made them our essential reading. So what was the classroom experience like and what kind of Dante did we receive? We watched a brilliant, deeply learned, critical mind, articulate, witty, and crystal clear, take on one of the greatest works of world literature. He would exhaustively read an individual canto of the Commedia and connect it uh, both to real life issues problems of literary forms to vast intellectual traditions and contexts. These were performances, carefully crafted, jokes carefully strewed in place, carried out from memory, polished and repeated from year to year that seemed to be spontaneous. We were watching a mind at work. We were invited into John's thinking as he worked out what would be classic articles on the Medusa episode on Inferno 9 and it was incidentally there that we got the point of Demand's rhetoric of temporality essay and on the tragedy of Ugolino. So we felt we were inside Vulcan's forge. John insisted on the autobiographical model for the Commedia of Augustine's Confessions. Perhaps in reaction to his own early education and its insistence on Thomism, John recovered and emphasized the medieval Platonic tradition, particularly of Chalcidius's translation of the Timaeus. Millicent Marcus recalls to me John's profession of astonishment, it was a famed profession of astonishment, that none of us knew who the pseudo Dionysius the, Dionysius the Areopagite was, and then we were sent off to read him. He drew invaluable diagrams on the blackboard, on the shape of the Aristotelian soul, on the fourfold levels of biblical allegory. He charted and explained ancient and medieval geometry and astronomy. He was especially proud of his essay on Dante's Pilgrim in a Gyre because it was voted their favorite literary essay by students at MIT. So I'm going to conclude this reminiscence by reading to you my class notes from 1969 to his first class on the Commedia. I have to say, I was a good note taker. Commedia, divine is 16th century. Begins with conversion, glance at sun. If this were Neoplatonism, the poem would end. Conversion does not succeed. Nostro vita mi ritrovai. Maximal difference between common humanity and I alone. The two trajectories will come together. The all-knowing authorial voice and straight man personage must also come together. How the character becomes the author. To read, one must have read. The ending gives meaning like a sentence, 11th book of confessions. End is moment of death. Every autobiography must be
believe we've been waiting patiently for David's uh, audio to reconnect here, but it is not seeming to reconnect. David, I'm very sorry. Okay, there we go. Not quite yet. Okay. Um, perhaps Eileen, we should have you pick up here. Um, sure. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you well. I'm going to spotlight you for everyone. Okay. Thank you. Um, why that fellow doesn't know his Plutarch from Petrarch. And then in a drier voice closer to his own, you can just put him on your negative reading list. These were not the first words I heard my mentor John Fritcherl say, but they came early in my acquaintance with him in what passed for winter 1983 in Palo Alto. The referent was not anyone we, his audience, actually knew, some sad in situ icon of ignorance, more likely a distant critic stumbling over a crux. I suppose I recognized in the plosives, in the internal rhymes, in the gesture to an almost infectious ineptitude that this was not a serious assessment. And my own grasp but the distinction was weak. I had begun to see Petrarch not as a lyrical love-struck lounge lizard, but as the innovative linguistic idolater that he was. But Plutarch? He, or rather an anecdote from On the Withering Away of the Oracle, soon came up in a connection I can no longer summon, beginning with, you'll recall the story, which I then took to be a tactful way of including those to whom the tale was entirely new, in which I only now see is something between a command and a prediction. For Cheryl said that during the time of Tiberius, Epithyrses was sailing from Greece to Italy when a voice from a nearby island rang out calling for Thamus. As it turned out, this was the name of the Egyptian pilot. The unseen speaker urged him to announce in sailing past another island that great Pan was dead. Thamus did so, and even as he was speaking, an immense roar of amazed sorrow arose. The story soon spread in Rome. Tiberius questioned Thamus. The singular event was verified by the emperor's philologist. Now, Fritschero did not have a dog in this race. He was more in, interested in the array of interpretations. Some saw in the story Christianity's triumph over pagan gods, others an allusion to the, in that offshore oracle to the recent death of Christ himself, while still others claim that neither Pan nor pivoting Egyptian pilots had any place here, that the garbled message and anguish outcry was actually a ritual call and response of, uh, for the death of Adonis, whose Syrian name happened to be Thamus. What seemed to me typical in this vignette was Fritschero's intense delight and the ways in which the same phonemes might be appropriated for an alien tradition, then boldly repurposed, and then identified as the robust repository of error. While he insisted that the critical resolution of any textual crux had to be a philologically driven this way and no other, the horizon of all such work was the messier realm of multivalent, often mutually exclusive cultural readings. That environment was also ours in comparative literature at Stanford, where he was then serving as chair. His administrative touch was light. He once confessed to us that he could never recall our requirements as if we had ever imagined it were otherwise. And I suspect that he devoted little attention to the care and feeding of his colleagues. But none of us ever had or ever would again encounter anything like his incandescent combination of intellectual energy and personal warmth. These two qualities, that sharp focus, that broad sociability, were not successive postures of professorial work and then play, but more of a continuum for him. At stake in his articles and lectures were both an implicit belief in various and evolving systems, linguistic, literary, religious, societal, and a question of scale or a signal to noise ratio. His task 
was to show how particular clusters of aberrant details, an odd rhyme, an unexplained plural, a false note, an insistent alliteration, expose, altered, and even compromised the workings of those systems. Scholars as different in their disciplinary location as René Girard, Michel Serre, and David Welbury were interested in the applicability of systems theory to the literary domain. And while I think Frichero would have resisted these voguish labels, he was the animating force there. For all his accomplishments, he indulged in none of that tiresome beacon of genius business. Who else would say that as a husky kid, he was disquieted by a reference in Silent Night to Round John Virgin, or that his first and worst job was heaving cans of Dr. Pepper into the carts of unsuspecting shoppers, that he lasted there less than a day, and that the breaking point came when some sweet old lady said, no, thank you, Sonny, gives me gas. Or that when leaving the auditorium after giving an invited lecture, he overheard one student say to another, well, I didn't understand a thing he said, but you've got to admit he's very well informed. Or that when he and Robert Caskey arrived at, to give a lecture at Princeton's Index of Christian Art, a staff member said, boys, just bring the truck around back. These and other festive tales weren't a form of humble braggadocio. Rather, they signaled in the short term that the most mortifying moments had all the makings of excellent anecdotes, which was good advice for graduate students, and God knows better still for the assistant professors we hope to become. In the long term, they suggested that conversational genres, like their literary counterparts, had constraints and possibilities that these emerged most clearly when put under pressure by matters out of place, that the swift impact of embarrassment and the frisson of eventual delight correlated with shocks to particular linguistic and social systems. Now, for all his interest in the rules that governed various discourses, he offered little in the way of professional guidance. Avoid vulgar careerism, he said on occasion, a context dependent joinder that meant when translated to the vernacular, either don't ask for an instant letter of rec or publish only when you have something to say. As for our seminar papers, it was don't get it right, get it in writing, uttered in the, that blustery key of Plutarch, Petrarch. And this was not about efficiency but was instead the recognition that writing is real labor, that it takes time, that it is the threshing floor of thought and where we had our last and best chances of getting it right. When I was considering my dissertation topic, he did not say as others did, then look too literary. He observed instead that Italo Calvino had described Galileo Galilei as the finest of Italian writers, and that when his audience had suggested that this was gibberish, a strange, possibly senescent slip of the lip, and substituted other and more plausible names, Calvino had remained confident in his choice. Now, that novel's, novelist's own account implies some wavering. When Carlo Casola asked about Dante, Calvino then changed the category to Italian prose. And then he confessed that Machiavelli might just muscle his way into the winner's circle, either because he shared such hesitation or just for the sheer fun of it, Frichero tarted the story up for me. And it went something like this. Oh no, Mr. Calvino, you must mean Marino. Hell no. Uh, Gabriello Chiabrera, hell no, Machiera, and so on. Galileo crushing his peers, his successors, but never facing, much less vanquishing his forerunners. I'd like to conclude with an antitype of the great pan tale and a request. 
As we made our way through purgatory in the winter of 1983, weirdly, a tape recorder crept along the classroom wall, each week positioned a little closer to the speaker. Eventually, a grad student from English, someone crazy smart or maybe just plain crazy, swept into the room, snapped a Polaroid of the blackboard, retrieved the recorder, and approached Frichero with that awful admixture of obsequiousness and entitlement, so often our only idiom, she explained that while she had heard that his was an excellent course, it conflicted with another. She then urged him to speak more loudly and went at the blackboard for greater contrast to start with a clean slate, to move from left to right and from top to bottom and never ever to erase. E giovato sarebbe. Now, Fritchero answered with economy and uncharacteristic embarrassment and blandness. He said something like, I see, or okay, or got it, and evidently bombed the beacon of genius test because neither the devices nor their owner ever returned. But what we would give now for those tapes, or even the pallid Polaroid postille. In the absence of such odd artifacts, I cannot wait to hear what you recall of the great man we have loved and lost. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eileen. I wonder if I could call on David um, to come back <laughs> and finish, I don't know, three sentences. Uh, David, are you there? I'm here. Um, well, the rest of it was going to be the rest of the notes, which were about another page. Um, I don't, you know, I think, I think you get the point. Um, uh, it's up to you. I, you I remember the word, the last word I heard was autobiography. I don't know if that helps you. Okay. Every was. autobiography must be complete, must be an epitaph. And that of course is it got cut off, uh, talking about at the end is the moment of death. Uh, drowning man, life flashes before the eyes, but we know this because some drowning men survive. Look at image of swimmer. Retrovare, to retrieve from drowning. Christian autobiography is the record of conversion, thus radical discontinuity. Why write it? To tell of the good, apologetic, to bear witness. Seventh Book of Confessions deals with Augustine's attempt at Platinian ecstasy and intellectual truth ends in failure. Augustine distinguishes between seeing light, guardai in alto, and reaching it, Moses on Mount Tabor. This is a Pauline doctrine, man has fallen being, the good that I would, I do not do. Persona, body, insistence on presence of the body, così l'animo mio, mind, spirit, in secular intellectual sense. Posato il corpo, lasso, drag of body, problem of incarnation. Different from the common medieval vision poem, flight of disembodied mind, problem of the so-called allegorical structures of cantos one and two. This is no tired swimmer. This is a shipwreck. Pelago, passo, exodus. How can a pelago be a passo? Exodus. But if no man ever left alive, he has survived something no one else has ever done. Insistence on uniqueness, the exception. Pie fermo, again, Augustine 7, see Frichero's article. Ed ecco, ed ecce, now projection into external world of internal states of contemplation. Hope gets him by leopard and lion, Easter, creation, annunciation, March 21st, first day of Florentine calendar but he can't get by the wolf. You can't get by, you can get by without being a murderer, traitor, or being gratuitously violent, but the common sins to all stop him. Pilgrim is at position of minus one, not zero. Plato's cave can only be found after hell has been traversed to strip away illusion of idea of negative transcendence. That is that you can cancel out something instead of overcoming by some addition by bringing something more. Piaggio, water imagery continues. 
Superbo Ilion, Umile Italia, also a quote from Virgil, Umile Italia, low lying. Virgil writing truth without knowing it. Dante's rereading, Ilion as a happy fall, Felix Culpa, allowing a restoration, redemptive act in history. The Greyhound, dark prophecy of Inferno, grows clearer until Cacciaguida comes along. Virgil, sua città, quello imperador, Rome, the political interpretation. Fricero, colon, not political in modern terms, but can this deny the political thrust, for isn't sin the root of Florentine troubles? Thank you, and thank you, John. Thank you, David. I'm glad we asked you to finish it. That's lovely that you kept your notes. Oh my goodness, um, all those years ago. Okay, so thank you, uh, Danielle, for waiting and we can get the spotlight in her. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Allison, and thank you, Warren, for the lovely introduction and to everyone here. Um, I first met John Fricero in Florence in 2007, as Warren mentioned, and um, as you can well imagine, he was a bit different by then, nearing the end of his career. And um, as I realized later, much less guarded and more self-deprecating with me than he was with his other students, um, shared more of himself with me more quickly than he might have. And uh, of course, endlessly talking about the subject of his own death, apropos of our current meeting. Uh, but he was still John, and when I met him in Piazza Santo Spirito and sitting in his bespoke suit, smoking, drinking a martini, he had taught the bartender at Cafe Ricchi to make to his liking. And I had come to Italy to do my master's degree under the impression I would work on early modern literature. Uh, John made quick work of that, of course, and soon I was writing a thesis on Purgatorio. It seems comical to even imagine I would escape his orbit, but at the time I naively believed I had come to the decision myself. I knew then that having a year in Florence with him was special, and now it seems like one of the rarest things that could happen in any life. We spent most of the time in very informal settings at first, and because of that, I enjoyed a kind of attention that allowed me to not just learn all the things that his other students have discussed so far, but also learn much about myself very quickly. The proper seminar we had was with all the other graduate students there, some like me just starting their research, others more advanced cycling through fellowship years as they worked on their dissertations. But a lot of our conversations were just like our first one in the piazza over drinks usually too many, but luckily we both lived very close. So when I was going back to New York to start my PhD after finishing my master's, I, I don't think, uh, or in any case, I can't remember ever reflecting upon it consciously. But if I had, I, I wouldn't have thought that the exchanges we had in that Florentine context could translate over to New York to NYU to the large undergraduate lecture format successfully, that the same professor would be able to engage the kind of unwieldy and disparate groups with such different formations that came to a class that was at the time, I think still called Western Civ in some format, but uh, later uh, returned in any case as a requirement for moving on. Most of the students just wanted to walk out relatively unscathed by the end of the semester, as I recall. Um, whatever I had expected, I know I still remember the first time I saw him lecture to a class like that. I remember that um, no one had bothered to open up the auditorium properly. A lot of the lights weren't on. Most of the students hadn't sat down yet. Everyone was still rustling and chatting. He made no announcement didn't introduce himself, didn't say what the class was called, didn't say what we were reading, didn't give any point of reference uh, of any kind. He just started talking about Inferno One and everyone paid attention. It was uncanny. And when he concluded after 50 tight minutes as he always did, he said, if you have any questions about anything administrative, you can ask my brilliant assistant, Danielle Caligari. I was surprised to learn I was brilliant 
and his assistant. <laughs> um, and that I was meant to know things about administration because I was a first year graduate student having just returned from years in Florence and having absolutely no knowledge of how uh, anyone was supposed to proceed with anything uh, at that point. But uh, he took his book and his cane and he said, I'll meet you for lunch at our usual place. And I was bombarded and uh, had the trial by fire that he no doubt knew was appropriate for that stage of career. The whole semester went forward like that and many more after it. I assisted him throughout my years at NYU. All of his classes were always over enrolled. All the students always said his was the best class they had taken in his college career. And everyone always left happy. Um, for some reason, I seemed surprised at the end of each of those classes, despite uh, having a learning curve. He was unquestionably a captivating lecturer and inspiring teacher, as we've all established, and I, I think many have experienced here. And clearly, he was confident in, in both of those things himself. But I think what made him most successful was his confidence in the text. He never once doubted that Dante was the most thrilling thing you could talk about. And that unwavering faith in the poem was the rudder that kept us sailing smoothly ahead. The semester after I defended my dissertation, I was hired as an adjunct at NYU and John was retiring. So he let me live in his apartment for the semester. It was his way of taking care of me and his way of holding on to something he wasn't entirely ready to let go of. And when I moved in, he called me to make sure I had everything I needed, reminded me that the closet was absolutely brimming with gin and noted that he needed just a few things if I would be so kind as to FedEx them to him in California. A Xenia suit hanging in the closet, an Omega watch sitting on the dresser and a well-worn copy of a portrait of the artist as a young man on the night table. It was a performance of who he was, but it was also who he was. And I remember when he said that, I thought to myself, I'm going to tell everyone the story when you die. And then I thought to myself, but you already knew that. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, Danielle. That was great moving. Okay, so, um... I guess we're gonna turn it over to um, Simone um, to talk about the next triplet we have. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alison. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, and uh, you know, thanks. my heartful thanks go to the uh, Dante Society of America for uh, organizing this tribute to uh, Alison, to Warren for suggesting the idea actually from, uh, from the start. Uh, um, and to Frank Ordiway, of course, who co-organized uh, with me this part of the uh, of the proceedings. Uh, um, really, this is the time in which, uh, with a, in a somber note, but also with gratitude and happiness, we uh, honor Quay Savi Gentil uh, and uh, um, for uh, Bob Hollander. Um, we will hear from three students. Uh, uh, of his here at Princeton in his almost uh, you know 40 years uh, at this university. He didn't move much. Uh, I mean, he was uh, uh, rooted at Princeton and, you know, and left, uh, a, as you will hear, a um, deep, deep mark on uh, uh, many of us. Many of his students and colleagues uh, are in the audience. I, I saw uh, Filippo, I saw Stephen, Carla, Lauren, uh, and of course, uh, uh, John Fleming, uh, he's here, not a student, but a beloved colleague as well. Um, Janice Marr, I think I saw her as well um, among the students and colleagues. Um, and I also want to very quickly uh, acknowledge uh, uh, another person uh, who is here, which is Ted Catchy, who's the person uh, to whom I, uh, you know, Oh, uh, having met Bob for the first time uh, a long time ago at the University of Notre Dame, I got stuck with Bob for a whole morning because he was visiting the uh, Notre Dame and uh, Ted uh, pretended, I am sure now that he you know, faked 
that he had uh, you know uh, some something to do and uh, he stuck me with Bob. He charged me with entertaining him for the whole morning and I took him to play with computers and the OBI and um, you know we began there um, our um, you know friendship and for me my apprenticeship. So um, enough about me. Uh, the three persons that I uh, I'm going to introduce right now uh, are. Georgia, uh, in the order in which they uh, actually left Princeton. So the first one is Georgia Nugent, uh, and she's a Princeton graduate from the class of 1973 and is the president of Illinois Wesleyan University. Uh, the second person is William Stoll, Bill, for everybody at Princeton, who's a, a graduate of the class of 1994 and is currently associate professor of the classics at Colgate University. And uh, last but not least, Jessica Levenstein, who uh, got her PhD from Princeton in 1998 and is right now uh, head of upper division and a professor of English at the Horace Mann School uh, in the Bronx in New York. And uh, so I'll, uh, uh, I'll call on Georgia. Uh, Christian, can you spotlight her? Wonderful. Georgia, the floor is yours. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Simone. Um, I, I want to uh, especially thank the society. I am, I am deeply honored to be asked to participate in this tribute to Bob Hollander. Um, but it is a very difficult task because there is so much to say. Uh, so I have tried to put together a few um, highlights of my memories of him. But again, there is so much I, I don't even touch here on the wonderful collaboration that laid in their lives, uh, Jean and Bob had on the translation and so many other things, but I will try to cover a, a bit. Bob had a tremendous influence on my life, both professionally and personally. And I'll divide what I'm going to say into two parts. Um, my experience of, of Bob as an undergrad and then after those undergraduate years. I'm going to digress a little bit. Um, this was such a personal relationship. I'm going to say a little bit personally about myself to be clear about Bob's influence. Um, and I think it may be particularly fitting because this is Derby Day. I grew up on the racetrack. My father and my grandfathers were thoroughbred horse trainers. So before I went to university, I was essentially transient. We would follow the, the seasons and move from track to track. So my freshman year at university was the longest time I had ever lived in one place. Um, consequently, as you can imagine, Princeton was a revelation to me. <laughs> so, so different from anything I had ever known. And Bob was a big part of that, really Bob and Jean. I took, I believe two, maybe three of his European literature courses. They were essentially surveys introducing me to authors that I not only had never read, but had never heard of in the usually pretty bad schools that I attended. And then, of course, I took the Dante course, uh, sometimes affectionately known at Princeton as the organic chemistry of humanities. Um, you, some of you on this call may be familiar with Bob's method, which was that essentially you had to memorize the entire comedy <laughs> because the exams would just take a random passage and you had to elaborate upon it and its context and what it meant and so forth. So it was a very sneaky way of getting you to thoroughly uh, know the text. Um, those studies led me eventually to write my senior thesis on Dante and Virgil with Bob as my senior thesis advisor. And I am gonna say a bit more about his undergraduate teaching at the close of my remarks. But as influential as Bob was intellectually for me, I also wanna mention that he and his wife, Jean, were perhaps even more so personally. I often babysat for their two young children. And I see that they have a son and a daughter, Cornelia and Robert, but more frequently known as Zaz and Buzz. And I see that they're actually on the call and it's great to, to see you both. Um, so Bob would drive me out to their extraordinary home in the country. It was to me an amazing place designed by his brother an architect. The enormous living room had grand floor to ceiling French doors and looked like a ballroom. Adjoining was a very formal dining room. A peacock often roamed the grounds. 
<laughs> but the heart of the house was a very welcoming kitchen full of things I had never encountered. I don't think I'd ever had espresso and served with a lemon twist. Who knew such things existed in Italy? Certainly not me. Bob and Jean introduced me to an idea of um, a cosmopolitan as well as an intellectual life. Actually, uh, when the kids were asleep, I think my recollection is that I divided my time about equally from my Virgil, between my Virgil homework and Jean's Vogue magazines. But the relationship with Bob didn't end with graduation. In one of the classes, in one of his classes, I, I don't even know which one, I had written an essay on Vita Nuova. Bob wrote a comment on that paper that incentivized me in a truly unique way. And I suppose taught me one of the most important lessons for a scholar about uh, working and revising and revising and revising. Um, he must have liked the argument of that paper, but thought that the writing needed work. His comment was, oh, and he must have known that I was interested in fashion. His comment was, it's like you're wearing the most beautiful dress at the ball, but you're dancing in tennis shoes. Now, today's young women might actually do that, but right back then it was all glass slippers all the way. <laughs> so, so nothing could have prodded me more to revision. Even after graduation, I was determined to approve that paper. By this time, Dante was so much a part of my life that I petitioned my graduate department at Cornell to let me enroll in the undergraduate Dante course. And so I had the opportunity to study as well with Giuseppe Mazzotta. During that summer, I worked on revising the paper. And in 1973, it was awarded the Dante Prize of America by the society. I, I noted, because I had to go back and realize, figure out when that was, I noted in doing that, that there have been 13 Princeton honorees since then. And that's clearly a tribute to the teaching of Robert Hollander and now Simone Marchese. But I was not the only student who remained engaged with Bob and with Dante after graduation. In 1977, Bob began offering an annual Dante seminar. Reunions at Princeton are an enormous big deal, drawing as many as 10,000 people to a multi-day celebration. Predictably, beer usually dominated the affair. But Bob changed all that. For about four decades, every Friday afternoon of reunions at four o'clock, Bob offered a seminar-style seminar discussion of Dante. <clears throat> The, the passage to be discussed was always assigned ahead, ahead of time and distributed to a list eventually of hundreds of former students, some number of whom would gather each year for the discussion. The tradition in fact became so well known and popular that the university began adding much more academic con content to that weekend. Then after about a quarter century of the Dante seminar, some of Bob's students decided it was time for a super seminar. We would not only gather on campus to study Dante, we would go to Italy and we would study together. I'm sorry, <laughs> it was obviously a big influence. <laughs> we would study together, not only for an hour, but for a week. In 2000, about 30 of Bob's students, different ones at different times, began to gather together biennially in a castello outside Florence for a glorious week together. We would read and discuss Dante for hours each day, break bread together in the cortile, in the evening put on performances, both professional and decidedly amateur, and in short, enjoy a truly remarkable fellowship that Bob's generosity as a teacher had brought about. The tradition continued for a decade and more until Bob's health made it um, un untenable. I also want to say I, that, um, of course, when Bob suffered his stroke, it was such a, such a blow. He had always been so active, continued to be an active tennis player. And I think many of us wondered how he would handle this because he had always been such a, an energetic person. 
And uh, it, was, it was a revelation, and I think a very meaningful one to many of us as his students, how he dealt with that in such a stoic way and in such a positive way. He taught himself how to be able to continue being productive as a scholar, even though partially paralyzed and so forth. It was an amazing, an amazing time. Um, back to the, the super seminar. Um, I think all of us who participated, and there are several on this call, remember those as magical times. Some few of us were academics, but there was a poet, a pediatric oncologist, a librarian, a financier, an opera singer, a gaggle of lawyers, uh, a concert level pianist, all of us around a seminar table with our battered dog-eared copies of the Commedia in Singleton's translation before Bob and Jean had collaborated on theirs. Passionate discussion would take place about theological references, Florentine history, allegory, poetics. That passion, that continued engagement with Dante after decades was the clearest evidence there could be of how Bob's teaching changed lives. And I wanna conclude with my two most powerful memories of his undergraduate teaching. I said I would circle back to that. At some point early on in his career, I don't know when, Bob developed the habit of including students' thoughts and comments in his text as marginalia. So for example, you might be sitting in the Dante seminar decades after you had been a student and hear Bob suddenly call out your name and mention the comment you had made on a certain passage in the Commedia. Your opinion mattered and it was to be taken seriously. He invited you into the company of scholars. And the memory of Bob that has never left me in all these years is how he would almost bound into the classroom, all excitement, waving the day's text in his hand saying, isn't this great? <laughs> I sat up all night reading this. And we would launch into the day's discussion. I thought to myself, that sounds like a pretty good life to me. And I think that's what I want to do with my life. And that's what happened. I'm sorry for losing it here. <laughs> thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia. Thank you so much. Georgia, thank you. It's beautiful. Thank you. Um, just very quickly before I, I, I move to Bill, uh, actually to second what Georgia just said. Um, when I met Bob, he wasn't alone. He was, at, uh, uh, was giving a talk about Dante's Ulysses and the Lucanian sources of Dante's Ulysses. And uh, um, I mean, it's, it was a paper that was being uh, just being published and he was not alone. Bill Stoll was there because he was the co-signer of that uh, piece. And when I saw that kind of uh, um, honest collaboration and uh, generous, uh, real uh, engagement with the thoughts of his students, I said, I want to part of that. I really want to part of that. Bill. Uh, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you, Simone. And thanks also to Frank Ordaway for asking me to participate and for the Dante, to the Dante Society for organizing this wonderful event. Thank you, Georgia, too, for the great reminiscences, many of which I will echo. Uh, it's an honor to be with all of you um, and to say a few inadequate words about Bob Hollander, whose contributions to Dante studies were so significant in such a variety of ways. For me personally, Bob was and remains a decisive influence, truly life-changing as a teacher and mentor. I draw inspiration from his example all the time and the highest tribute I can offer is to say that in, in teaching my own students, whatever the subject, I consciously try to give them at least a portion of what Bob gave me. And so to quote Virgil in Inferno 20, in one of Bob's favorite episodes, un poco mi piace che m'ascolte. One bit of wisdom I always pass along to my students is that they should, when they choose classes, they should quote, pick the professor, not the course. I know that's good advice because it's exactly how I wound up taking Bob's class when I was a sophomore at Princeton 30 years ago. Back then, I didn't know much about Dante and felt no great desire to spend a semester studying him. But I had heard from a number of people, older friends at college, even my high school Latin teacher, who was an alumnus from the 60s, that a course with Hollander was among the best that Princeton had to offer. 
I also had a general interest in literature, I suppose. Uh, and uh, I was looking for a challenge and inspiration after a fairly mediocre freshman year. So I signed up for Romance Languages 303, Dante's Divine Comedy, and duly purchased the required three volumes of Sinclair and six of Singleton. The initial impressions I formed of Bob during that semester never really changed through all the years of knowing him. From the start, Bob radiated seriousness and dedication, and for that reason was intimidating in the best possible way. He made no bones about the fact that he intended his course to be challenging, and he never apologized for his high standards, his strong opinions, or his conviction that we should work as hard at knowing and understanding Dante as he did. I was looking in my files this morning to see whether I had the first handout he gave us. I probably actually do have some notes too, but I didn't think to look for those. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't put my hands on it, but in any case, it was this big substantial packet uh, containing numerous passages excerpted from nearly every canto in the poem. Now, the way Bob presented this was to tell a story, uh, which I don't know how accurate it was, but it was his story that uh, at one point years earlier, he had a class that became slack and he noticed they weren't doing the reading and their exams were slipshod. I'm sure this was not Georgia Nugent's year, by the way. Um, in response, he'd made this packet and established the expectation that students needed to be able to identify every passage on it and provide every bit of relevant information about its significance. In any case, as a lecturer and seminar leader, Bob had a kind of charisma that I rarely encountered and wish I possessed myself, a gift for gaining and holding an audience's attention without needing to resort really very much to rhetorical or dramatic flourishes. At the same time, for all the power of his presence, the depth of his learning and the vigor of his views, it was clear that the focus was never on Hollander, but always on Dante. Influential though he was in the lives of many, Bob wanted his students to see themselves as fellow scholars and explorers, not as acolytes. I think I learned more in that course about the study of literature at a high level, not only what it involved, but also crucially why it mattered uh, than in any course I ever took, graduate or undergraduate. Partly this was a matter of the format. There's a lot to be said for spending an entire semester reading a single work over and over again under the guidance of someone who knows it backwards and forwards and requires that you do the same. Partly it was a matter of Dante, of course, who was inexhaustible and all encompassing. And partly it was a matter of the kinds of students that Bob uh, attracted, a quirky and diverse group of undergraduates who weren't too scared to enroll in a course that as Georgia reminded us was sometimes referred to as the organic chemistry of the humanities. I still recall a rather eccentric member of the class my year talking one day about something he'd recently read in the works of Prudentius. That kind of thing didn't often happen in Princeton classrooms, I have to say. Um, behind it all was Bob's insistence that details mattered, that being well and deeply read was non-negotiable, and that a good interpretation needed to withstand criticism and rely on something more than sentiment. One quickly learned in his class how many gaps there were in one's knowledge and how urgently they needed to be filled. Working through an episode of the comedy with Bob meant embarking on an exhilarating intellectual journey that would typically include in varying measures and often in unexpected and intricate ways, the Bible, the ancient Roman epics, Christian authors of late antiquity and the Middle Ages. Woe to you if you thought you could get anywhere without knowing your Aeneid, your Psalms, and your St. Augustine. In addition to that seriousness of purpose, the other defining feature of Bob's teaching in those days was its blending of tradition and technology, of ancient books and new computers, which was successful in a way I have to say I haven't observed before or since. Uh, believe it or not, it was owing to Bob and Dante that I opened my very first email account. This came about because the class had a listserv, also a novelty, at least to me, which we were all required to join on and on which Bob encouraged us to post any questions and observations that occurred. The idea was to keep class discussion going steadily more or less around the clock. And I really do mean around the clock since Bob would routinely answer queries at two or three in the morning, showing a level of dedication and stamina that astonishes me still. Perhaps more profoundly, Bob also introduced us on day one to the Dartmouth Dante Project. 
It might be easy to take it for granted now, along with all the other resources available on the internet. But back then, and to me as a sophomore, the DDP was an absolute revelation. Centuries worth of commentary in multiple languages, all devoted to one poem, all available and searchable remotely. Not only had Bob been a prime mover in starting the DDP, and it amazes me that he had the vision to do that all the way back in the early 1980s. Uh, he also knew how to use it, encouraging us in turn to explore its riches and to see ourselves as participants in a conversation that had been going on with copious amounts of learning, enthusiasm, and controversy for centuries. That last point seems to me the fundamental one. In everything about Bob's teaching, in fact, everything about Bob's teaching and research seemed to reflect a belief that the conversation never ends and that we all potentially have something to contribute to it. Just as Dante wrote in continual engagement with earlier history and literature, creating a comprehensive vision that embraced past, present, and future, so Dante's readers, as Bob would portray them, the dead and the living, approach his poem in an ongoing dialogue with one another sometimes enlightening, often contentious, but always worth taking seriously. There was no place for temporal, professional, or social chauvinism in Bob's class, in his style of interpretation, or I dare say in his approach to life as a whole. As its readers can't help but notice, and as uh, Georgia already mentioned, Bob's own commentary on the comedy is unique in this regard, and not just in Dante studies, in that its citations include not only the full range of ancient sources, medieval commentators and modern scholars, but also Bob's own undergraduate students, their classroom observations scrupulously recorded by name and date and not in small numbers either. It was the same impulse that lay behind Bob's creation of the Dante reunions um, to which all of his former students were invited every year and that went on and there were 44 of them, um, which is just an extraordinary record. Well, there's more I could say about Bob, about my experience co-writing an article with him, about the determination with which he faced health challenges during his retirement years, about the great partnership with his wife, Jean, and their joint work in translating the comedy. But maybe it's best to leave it there with the thought of Bob's many students, and one hopes all of Dante's readers partaking in an ongoing communion. What could be more Dantean after all? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Bill. And uh, um, I'm acknowledging that Jessica, there you go. Uh, you're being spotlight. The floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank Simone and Frank for inviting me to speak about Robert Hollander today. And thank you to Allison, Christian, and the Dante Society's Governing Council for making today's program of tributes possible. Uh, many of the remarks I'm gonna make echo what you've just heard. And I think that's a, a tribute to Bob's um, indelible mark on all of us. Um, I met Bob in the fall of 1992. When I started the graduate program in comp at Princeton, I knew I wanted to do something with the classical tradition and I knew I'd enjoyed the Dante class I'd taken in college. So I found my way to the only Dante class Bob was offering that fall, his legendary undergraduate Commedia class about which you have heard so much. Uh, the arrangement was going to be that I would take all the same tests and quizzes as the undergrads, but would work on an extensive paper throughout the semester exploring a particular idea or question in the poem. By October, I was hooked. I found Bob at his office to talk about the essay on Inferno 15 that I was starting. And I told him I couldn't imagine anything more interesting than working to understand Dante's poem. He responded, studying Dante is like falling in love. There's nothing you can do to stop it. Let's pause for a second to talk about what it was like to visit Bob in his office. He seemed never to have the lights on and whatever light was in the room came from behind his head through the beautiful mullion windows on the third floor of East Pine. And you can see an example of the windows behind Simone now. Um, the result was that his face was cast mostly in shadow, his ears glowing with a faint pink light. And of course, pipe smoke filled the room. This was of course, 30 years ago. 
Entering his office was engaging in time travel. You walked through the wall of smoke and it was like you'd passed through the portal to the golden age of academia. You had all the time in the world and only one thing to think about and that thing was Dante. Bob loved teaching. He was equally delighted in front of a large lecture hall, magisterially guiding his undergrads through the afterworld in a cozy seminar room, urging his grad students to lay claim to interpretations of Il Ninfale Fiesolano or the Decameron, or in the garden of a rental house in Bellasguardo, going line by line through a dissertation chapter. Bob gave his students his full attention and he made it clear that their contributions had value. And as both Bill and George mentioned, uh, anyone who was ever in his famous Dante class can recall the moments when during his lecture, he would turn his copy of the text sideways and read out a tiny marginal note detailing an observation or comment a student had made years or decades earlier. And as we know, many of these marginal notes have ended up in his commentary as well. Each student hearing Bob cite the ideas of his former students learned the most important lesson he had to teach them, their ideas too had value. Any of us in the room could come up with something that made him pause, take out his pencil and preserve our thoughts for future students. I took every possible class with Bob and found as all of his students did that he was not only a captivating teacher whose evident respect for his students made our learning feel truly collaborative, but an extraordinary reader of student work. Bob read all our work at least twice, usually in different color inks, responding to and editing our writing with intense attention. For me, knowing that he cared enough about my writing to correct my accents or commas blunted any embarrassment I felt at having committed the errors to begin with. He, he once wrote at the back of an essay, I've picked nits because that's one of the things they pay me to do, but he didn't fool me. He, his nitpicking was support. His nitpicking was dedication. As in Simone Weil's overquoted line, Bob's attention was a form of generosity. His marginal comments were the best though. I have a couple examples. Um, one time he wrote, a bit wooden and pompous sounding. I completely agree. Um, another time he wrote, too bland a formulation. Forced argument, question mark. Not my favorite term, I confess. That the term was metaliterary. A happy verb, question mark. And that verb was highlights. And finally, whoa, it's not that easy. And that was uh, in reference to a simplistic grad student pronouncement uh, on the difference between Dante and Boccaccio. Then came the comment at the end, or sometimes weirdly on the back of a page in the middle of a chapter or essay. He would make elaborate charts to explain a thought, or in one case, write, I just found that I have about 10 pages of stuff on this that I started in 1993 on my computer. What a nice surprise. But of course, the best was the praise, which I may keep out of these remarks, but never out of my heart. Uh, I left academia to become a high school teacher at Horace Mann School in New York after a couple of disappointing turns on the job market. And no one was more supportive of this decision than Bob. From the first year I met him, he had said more than once, it'll be more fun to teach at a first-rate high school than a third-rate college. And when other colleagues or professors said, but you'll go to MLA again next year, right? I would remember his faith in me and his dedication to the practice of teaching. Nope, I'd respond, I'm a high school teacher now. Uh, my second year at Harsman, Mann, I introduced a senior Dante elective and was thrilled to be able to use Bob and Jean's newly published translation of Inferno as our text. My students got to know my teacher through the commentary, quickly growing attuned to Bob's humor, preoccupations and turns of phrase. It seemed only fitting that I would invite him to visit the class. And on a rainy day in December of 2002, Bob traveled into the city and rode the one train to the end of the line, Van Cortlandt Park, to meet my students. And Bob somehow found his way from the subway to the school cafeteria on his own and settled in with a plate of coffee cake to grade exams well before the time I was supposed to meet him. It was disorienting to encounter him calmly and productively marking up his stack of tests 
oblivious to the hyperactive sixth graders in front of him and the imperious seniors behind. Grubby cafeteria table or the mullioned windows of East Pine, it made no difference to Bob. He had his students work to read. We chatted for a few minutes and then I led him to class. As he approached the classroom, I could hear my students whispering, you guys, you guys, he's here, shh. The next 45 minutes represent one of the proudest experiences of my career. Bob was unsurprisingly gracious, incredibly knowledgeable, warm, and funny. And my students were very eager to impress him with their understanding of the poem and of his commentary. After class, the students applauded, looking thrilled and overwhelmed. And he signed each of their books, carefully transcribing their names on the cover page and shaking their hands one by one with great ceremony. The school newspaper that Friday described Bob as the fellow on the book jacket and one of the foremost experts on Dante reporting, Hollander spoke of Dante as one would speak of a relative with an intimacy that most scholars lack. Yes, exactly. After the class, Bob and I had lunch and I remember him turning to me to ask, are you happy? Is this life good for you? The question was sincere and I was touched by his concern. When I told him this life was deeply fulfilling and described the rewards and challenges, Bob listened carefully, conveying his genuine investment in my well being in a way that went so far beyond the role of teacher or advisor that it landed squarely, permanently on friend. The day Bob visited my class, I began to understand the way that those of us who teach are also always the students of our teachers. We create a chain of learning, of study, that leads from one impassioned reader to another, binding us all in our common belief that the worlds imagined by the works we read have as much to tell us as the world around us. Back in East Pine, Bob had told me I wouldn't be able to resist my love affair with Dante, and he was, of course, right. But what he didn't tell me was that through his gracious, kind, inspiring example, I wouldn't be able to resist my love affair with teaching either. Bob taught me and all his students that the world of ideas mattered and even more significantly that our ideas about these ideas mattered. He provided a model for working in the humanities without losing touch with the things that make us human in the first place. For our maestro's humanity, his generosity, his passion, his humor and his warmth, I will be grateful for all my life. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. Well, that's, that concludes our, um, our formal speakers. And as we said, uh, it was hard to choose, obviously, among the many, many people who have memories of these teachers. So I, I do, uh, want other people to contribute and I can monitor the chat. I, um, Rachel Jacob had mentioned maybe she would be ready to speak about something. I don't know if Rachel is, if she responds to that call, but um, Rachel, are you here? I don't see her, maybe she dropped off. Oh, no. Be here, Allison. There I'm you are, unmuting. you are here, okay. I'm unmuting, okay. I, okay. I actually um, had, thought of, of I, I mean so much this has been really wonderful because so many things I wanted to say I've already heard actually particularly some of the things that David Quinn said were exactly things that I wanted to talk about but I just will say a few things actually what's been in my the last few days I've been thinking about this moment and I've been thinking a lot about John and and who I miss terribly and who I've actually missed for several years because it's been very hard to communicate with him in the last few years. Um, and I don't know who, who first said this, but I think other people have said this as well. And I love this idea that it was John who taught us to see the stars. I don't know who, who first said that, but I always think of John as, as having lit up the world of, of the Paradiso in particular for all of us. And, and his classes were something that I will never forget because, you know, John had some way of combining um, lucidity and learning that was just extraordinary, I think, and that was a model for everybody. And so 
for years, I thought of his classes as the most illuminating experience of my life. And I followed John around. I first studied with him at Yale, and then I studied with him again when I was at Stanford, and he was too. And, and then again, saw him in New York. But, you know, this just never was enough of it because every time you heard him speak about Dante, there was a kind of illuminating moment that happened. And I, I think this was an experience that all of John's students shared. And in fact, another thing that I wanted to say was that some of the people that I ended up being very close to, I came to through Dante's, through John's Dante class. And I think particularly of Peter Hawkins, Nancy Vickers, Rosanna Warren, and also the other people in Italian at that moment at Yale, Penny, Marcus, and Rebecca West. So John created around him, I think, wherever he went, a kind of community of people who loved the text in the way that he taught us to love it. So that's just a partial um, reckoning of my great um, gratitude towards John for all the ways in which his teaching was a model for me and many other people about how to combine um, intellect and passion. So anyway, this has been Thank wonderful. You. Thank you all who spoke earlier. I want to say something nice about Bob Hollander too, um, which was that when we, when in the early years when we were very young and junior professors, and you know one would send something to Bob when he was the editor of um, Dante Studies, and he was so generous about that in that moment. That was a very good moment in his relationship to the profession, I think. And when we were young and unpublished, he he published some of the first things that I wrote and I wasn't the only one. So I think he did a great deal at that moment for Dante studies and for young people in it. Okay, thank you, Alice. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Rebecca. I see a hand, Samuel Newbold. Yes, um, so I was a, um, in 1998, um, I took the freshman seminar of um, Professor Robert Hollander. I, um, I, I was unsure what I was going to major in um, between chemistry, uh, mathematics, and physics. Um, I ended up being physics. I have I've been to the, the these reunions, and the, they all, the invitations always included a um, a warning against coming only for the um, only for the well catered reception afterwards, uh, which I worried about in that it's always always conflicts with the um, with the physics reunion. Uh, and so I have the, this split loyalty, but one of the surreal experiences of my life was um, during the um, during one of his um, one of the two classes that I took with Robert Hollander. Uh, he mentioned how how good a student David Duchovny had been, and it was one of those moments that just sort of strikes you as deeply strange. Did you hear that properly? We I thought I was listening to. Um, uh, information about medieval poetry and not pop culture. Um, but I duly remembered it. And five, 10 years later, found myself in a lecture, um, a discussion with David Duchovny and, and someone else and several hundred people in the room. And I've, I've gotten a good at getting my questions answered. So I, I raised my hand in the question and answer section and, um, and asked David Duchovny if, um, if he'd ever considered a career in um, in comparative literature uh, based on the high opinion that that Robert Hollander had, had had of him, and there was this pregnant pause, um, and you might expect him to respond, "Well, I'm a movie star. Of course, I wouldn't want to be involved in literature." Or, "Or who the hell are you talking about?" But, but no, he he responded um, how shocked he was that that Bob had such a high opinion of him and and jumped from the the formal name that I had remembered to the the more um the the simple name that, that he had known him by and afterwards thanked me for for letting him know that um just the the two of us face to face because he um this was after um uh, Professor Hollander's stroke and um and so David Duchovny had the impression that that he wouldn't be remembered by by his former professor. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I'm not seeing any hands, so um, I'm gonna read um, something I got. Well, I'm, I'll just read this quickly and then I'll move to Andrew. Thank you for 
raising your hand. Um, so uh, Dan Christian, uh, some of you people might know, is a high school teacher and a great uh, fan of, of the Dante Society. I'm sorry I'm going to miss tomorrow's meeting honoring Professor Solander of Fischero. If you know, if you think there would be any interest, please tell members that I recorded our phone interviews with each man from back in the 90s, along with my Gilman Dante class in Baltimore, my dear friend Milton Burke's literature class from Fayetteville High School in Arkansas was on the line as well. In total for each interview, our guests were talking to about 50 to 60 first time young Dante readers. The tone these two men showed in responding to questions was remarkable, frankly. They dignified each kid's question without remotely talking down to them. At a Dante Society meeting a number of years ago, I was told that, quote, scholarship is war. <laughs> These two Dante talks reinforced my hope that Nostra Vita gets the final word, not competition and rivalry. If any member would like me to send a copy of each recording, I'd be happy to do so. You can provide them with my email address. One more chance to pass the Dante music on. The tech folks here in Iowa can make this happen smoothly. Be well. I appreciate you both having brightened my own Dante journey so meaningfully. Thank you. Good luck. Peace, Dan. So that's Dan Christian. If you'd like those recordings, you can get in touch with the Dante Society. Um, so Andrew Porter, you have your hand up. Ah, uh, yes. I'm, I was a second generation uh, student of uh, Professor Hollander's at Princeton. Uh, my mother, Carla Volpe Porter, was also one of his students. So I am um, very proud of that particular fact. But I wanted to share a story. Uh, uh, as you may recall, he was the that Professor Hollander was the master of Butler College, one of the residential residential colleges at Princeton, and um, many of our meetings as a class uh, were around lunch in the Butler College uh, private private dining dining room, which is which is essentially a conference table in the corner of the Butler College dining hall. Um, at one point, at one one lunch uh, with the students, the special of the day was chicken nuggets. Um, he ate all his chicken nuggets and, and looked around and grabbed several off of my plate. Um, and so uh, I relayed this story to my much younger sister, whose favorite uh, story, whose favorite food in the world was chicken nuggets. And she was simply horrified that anyone of such stature would steal chicken nuggets from another human being. Um, I think she was probably eight at the time. And uh, subsequently, she asked me, so how is the nugget stealer? um as as she forever referred to him and perhaps to this day still does i told him about this that that uh my my baby my little sister uh referred to his august uh personage as the nugget stealer and he sighed and said well it's nice to be famous for something <laughs> um and then uh one final thing uh one of my uh prized possessions is my uh copy of the first edition of Holland, the, the Hollander, uh, the Hollander translation of the Inferno, which uh, I was fortunate enough to have uh, addressed, uh, dedicated to me by, by Professor Hollander and his dedication reads as follows. For Andrew, with this old master's good wishes and undiminished hopes. Robert Hollander, 10-23-01. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew, for sharing that. We have a hand from, from Italy, Giuseppe Ledda. Mm -hmm. Yes, good, good evening. We are, we are in, in evening in Italy, and I'd like to, to say a few words um, for, in order to thank, uh, thank you for organizing this, this wonderful tribute to these and to give um, a sort of, uh, of, 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 of sign to these two masters that have changed the way of interpreting Dante even in Italy. And you know that for Italian Dantisti, it's not easy to accept new perspective, new, new point view. But uh, in, in Italian appeared these two books. Uh, these from Don, Don, John Frecero, these by um, uh, Robert Hollander. And they changed not only personal way of understanding Dante, but uh, the way in which uh, uh, all my generation, uh, the junior generation, uh, read Dante. So we are very great, grateful to, to these two masters. And I'd like to, 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 to give this, this sign from Italy 
and thank you for uh, for uh, organizing this this tribute. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Giuseppe, for sharing that with us. Um, Oh, we have another hand from Donatella Stocchi Perucchio. Am I unmuted? Yes. Hello, everyone, and thank you for this beautiful, beautiful series of very moving presentations. Um, I have uh, just uh, a few flashes that I would like to share with you. First of all, I want to say about Professor Hollander. I met him many, many years ago. I spent an hour in a cafeteria talking about a paper that I just presented at one conference. And it was an impressive encounter that I always remember. And then uh, the second thing is that I use his translation uh, with my students because they insisted that that was so beautiful that they wanted to have that, even if it was for them a little hard. So that's a big tribute, and um, and uh, we all uh, we all continue to um, to reflect on his remarks, on his love for students, and on uh, his immense knowledge that uh, keeps uh, filling our classes. So that's for for Professor Hollander. About John Frechero, I was a student, a graduate student at Cornell in the late eighties, early uh, excuse me, late seventies, early eighties, <laughs> many years ago. Um, Frechero was no longer there, but um, his presence was there and uh, his legacy filled the, uh, the environment. I was a student of uh, Giuseppe Mazzotta. And once uh, in the early 80s, he came for a very short course, a few weeks, which I took, of course, and that's when I actually met him. And um, and then his writings, his pieces just uh, kept being uh, uh, with me and, and even haunting me for a long time when I wrote my dissertation and then, uh, and then my first book out of that on Pirandello, his uh, Zeno's last cigarette, his anti-conversion story and <laughs> interpretation of, uh, of Svevo was, um, was key for me to, to, to read Pirandello, as a matter of fact. And then, uh, um, and then in my postgraduate uh, years, I kept, uh, I kept reading and studying and meditating on his, uh, on his writings. And there is one thing that uh, just really was especially inspiring. I mean, I'm just being brief because a lot of stuff is inspiring, but that um, uh, piece on the last uh, final image in the, in the Commedia, and probably you all remember the drawing that accompanies in uh, uh, Rachel Jacobs' uh, um, edition of the curated edition of the poetry of conversion, um, in which we see the diagram that uh, accompanies uh, uh, the chapter. And I remember this anecdote that probably either he wrote somewhere or told people that he was sitting in the Temple of Zeus at Cornell and talking about how to interpret the, the wheel, <laughs> the, 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 the image of the wheel. And they were drawing together on a, on a napkin that, <laughs> that particular uh, understanding of, of the image of the wheel, uh, you know, following on Poulet's interpretation, but still, I mean, uh, legacy, but still in their own way. And from that napkin, the piece came. And uh, those are, you know, it was a seminal piece as, as all the others. And then uh, after that, um, I remember strolling through Manhattan with uh, many years, many years later, decades later, probably, with John Frechero and Maria Luisa Dizzone, a common friend and colleague, and talking about many things and fighting over political issues <laughs> and, uh, uh, and also sharing a lot of, uh, a lot of thoughts. And, um, I just uh, feel that his human trait is, is something that, that I will never forget. And there's one thing, a big honor that he gave me, undeserved, but, but uh, one day he said, lei e dei nostri, speaking about me. And I really felt, uh, not, you know, I wasn't a student of his and our encounters were sporadic, but I really felt like Dante, you know, like the, not the six, maybe the, <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't know what number among so much wisdom, but I was still very honored and, and I'm so grateful for, for all he has done and, uh, and for his legacy that is still with me and will always be with me. So thanks again for this opportunity to share these memories. Thank you, Donatella. All right, I see a hand from Julia Bolton Holloway. I was Bob Hollander's preceptor at Princeton for the European literature course. And it was, I loved his kindness. Later, I gave up being a professor and entered my convent in England. And he arrived with one of the commentaries for me to uh, edit. And um, I've always had this sense that he was someone one could turn to and share one's work with Dante, that there was always that um, warmth and uh, reception. Mm. I also heard a wonderful lecture by John Frigero at Princeton, which was um, really illuminating. And I've, I'm so grateful that I've had these two people uh, with their great ability to explain the texts and so forth. And just wish I still had them, uh, that there was still the possibility of dialoguing with them, especially now where I'm working very intensely with Dante's text and also Dante's Florence on the web in hypertextual ways, because I think um, Bob would have really appreciated that. Thank you so much for doing this, uh, the uh, Dante Society of America. And we can remember that he was also president of the Societa Dantesca Italiana after there had been a frightful row in Florence. They'd even had to call in the police uh, to sort it out. And he was made president to have uh, a time of peace for the Dantisti. Well, that sounds like a long story. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for whetting our appetite. Okay, we're coming up on, on four o'clock. And so we have been at this for two hours. So there are more things to say and more memories to share. And um, I hope we can find other opportunities to do it. But in the meantime, thank you very much to our speakers who prepared some really beautiful, moving, funny, um, really great, great reminiscences. I really appreciate it. And so I want to uh, release you all uh, back into uh, this May afternoon. And uh, thank you so much for, for coming and for caring about the Dante Society, uh, perhaps because you were moved by these great teachers. <laughs>